Hi everyone, welcome to the commercial property update. Um, I'm going to take the first section, which is in relation to MES, the minimum energy efficiency standards for commercial property. So the energy performance of buildings, England and Wales regulations 2012 require an energy performance certificate to be procured when a property is sold, let or refurbished. Energy efficiency, private rented property, England and Wales regulations 2015, also known as the minimum energy efficiency standards or MEES, set minimum standards for EPCs for private rented property in England and Wales. It's important to remember that the MEES regulations don't impose an obligation on the landlord to carry out energy efficiency improvements. They simply expose the landlord to enforcement action if they grant a lease on or after the 1st of April 2023 if they continue to let a property which is substandard and in breach of the MEES regulations. The prohibitions on granting or continuing a lease are set out in part three of the MEES regulations. Next slide, please. So from the 1st of April 2018, it became a legal requirement that for new commercial leases, the property must have an EPC rating of at least an E on a scale from A to G with A being the most efficient. Under part three of the MEES regulations, a landlord of a substandard non-domestic private rented property must not grant a new tenancy on or after the 1st of April 2018 unless either the landlord made sufficient energy efficiency improvements to the property so that it's no longer substandard or the landlord can claim a legitimate reason not to do so and this has been validly registered on the PRS exemptions register. From the 1st of April 2023 the minimum requirement will come into force retrospectively and it will be an offence to continue to let properties which do not achieve minimum E threshold unless the landlord makes sufficient energy efficiency improvements to the property so that it's no longer substandard or a valid exemption applies. Although from the 1st of April 2023 it will be unlawful for a landlord to let or continue to let a substandard property the lease itself is not affected and the lease will still be valid. It's estimated by the government that approximately 18% of commercial properties in England and Wales presently in the EPC, F and G rating brackets and determining whether a building and tenancy are within the scope requires owners to look at two sets of regulations, the energy performance of buildings, England and Wales 2012, and the MEES regulations and the interplay of both of the regulations is complex and sometimes there are potential loopholes created. Working out if a building and a tenancy are caught within the scope of MEES isn't always straightforward. MEES do not apply to, for example, buildings which are not required to have an EPC, such as industrial sites, workshops, non-residential agricultural buildings with low energy demand, certain listed buildings, temporary properties and holiday lets, buildings where the EPC is over 10 years old or where there's no EPC, tenancies of less than six months with no right of renewal and tenancies over 99 years. Licenses do not fall within the MEES regulations. However, the position regarding tenancies at will is less clear. MEES guidance doesn't cover tenancies at will, and some commentators have suggested that since a tenancy at will doesn't create a legal interest in land, and it's not granted for a fixed term, they're not covered by MEES, although this position is yet to be tested. Landlords can let a building to which the MEES regulations apply, but which is below the minimum standard if any of the exemptions apply. And the exemptions are the golden rule being where an independent assessor determines that all the relevant energy efficiency improvements have already been made to the property 
or that the improvements would not pay for themselves through energy savings within seven years. Devaluation is where an independent surveyor again determines that the relevant energy efficiency improvements that could be made to the property are likely to reduce the market value by more than 5%. And third party consent, where consent from persons such as a tenant, a superior landlord, planning authority has been refused, or it's been given with conditions that the landlord cannot reasonably comply. Exemptions must be registered on the central government private rented sector exemptions register. And the exemptions are valid for five years only, and they cannot be transferred to a new landlord. So it's not long to go until the new MEES regulations come into effect. Here's what commercial property landlords should think about. Owners should look at their portfolio now, identify commercial properties which are subject to MEES, make a note of marginal properties with a rating of D or E, negotiate any improvement works in advance with tenants, check leases to consider if the costs can be passed on to a tenant, carry out sufficiency, su sufficient energy improvement works and consider whether an exemption applies. MEES applies to most commercial properties, but there are some exemptions. Properties that have a satisfactory EPC rating, so a rating of E or above. Properties that are not let on a qualifying tenancy, so it's less than six months or more than 99 years. The properties that aren't required to have an EPC, properties that aren't situated in England and Wales, and properties that are dwellings, which will be subject to minimum energy efficiency regulations specific for dwellings rather than commercial property. If a property falls into one of the exemptions, then MEES may not apply. Non-compliance with MEES could result in enforcement action and a fine. The penalty for non-compliance is based on the property's rateable value and carries a maximum charge of £150,000. For breaches with a length of less than three months, the maximum penalty for commercial properties is £5,000 or 10% of the rateable value of the property. And for breaches with a length of more than three months, the penalty doubles. The maximum penalty is £10,000 or 20% of the rateable value of the property. So all types of landlord will be caught by the maze regulations for a non-domestic private rented property. There's no distinction between the types of landlord, local authorities and public bodies who are landlords are equally subject to the MEES regime. Um, noted in paragraph four of the MEES non-domestic guidance. And it's the landlord's obligation to ensure that the EPC meets the requirements and the obligations to do that cannot be passed on to the tenant. However, the cost of carrying out necessary improvements may be passed on to a tenant under service charge provisions, depending on the terms of the lease. From the 1st of April 2023, if a property has an EPC certificate with a rating of F or G, it will be illegal for the landlord to let or continue to let that property unless a specific exemption applies. A property might be exempt where the landlord has already made all the relevant energy efficiency improvements or where there aren't any that can be made. Some properties are exempt because the tenancy is too short or too long to be caught by MEES. And a property might be exempt where the works would cause a material net decrease in the property's capital value by more than 5%, which must be verified by an independent surveyor. Non-compliance with MEES could result in enforcement action and a fine as set out before. The changes may result in landlords restricting tenants from making alterations or from carrying out works which could reduce the EPC rating of the property. Landlords might also seek to increase service charges to cover the cost of improving the building's energy efficiency. and the future of the minimum standards for commercial properties. The UK Energy White Paper 2020 confirms 
the policy intention that the future trajectory for non-domestic MEs will be EPC B by the 1st of April 2030. Therefore, although it may be tempting for landlords to target an EPC rating of E, which is the bare minimum, this might be short-sighted. Landlords that aim higher will be future-proofing their buildings for more stringent standards and make them a more attractive proposition for tenants, prospective purchasers and investors. A recent government consultation suggests giving local authorities access to bulk EPC data to assist local authorities in enforcement of MEES. Local authorities could potentially use this together with the information on the PRS exemption register to identify properties which are let in breach of the MEES regulations. It's always been anticipated that the bar would be raised. The government estimates that the proportion of commercial rented properties across England and Wales covered by MEES will increase from around 10% to around 85%. Key proposals of the consultation include a phased implementation of the EPCB by 2030 requirement with EPCC by 2027 to be set as an interim milestone. The phased implementation will be based on two year compliance windows. The first compliance window EPCC will run from 2025 to 2027 and the second window EPCB from 2028 to 2030. At each enforcement date in 2027 and 2030, landlords will need to demonstrate the buildings have reached the highest EPC band that a cost-effective package of measures can deliver. And all exemptions are to be reviewed at the start of each compliance window. So the legislation seems to show a move away from enforcement at the point of let. It notes that it would support landlords with the seven year payback test that the government is proposing a payback calculator with standardized purchase and installation costs of energy efficiency measures. A continual requirement for landlords to have an EPC to ensure that all lease renewals and properties where the tenancy is ongoing, but the EPC might have expired or caught. A requirement that listed buildings and those in a conservation area that are to be rented out have an EPC. This measure is intended to address the current uncertainty as to whether many listed buildings are required to have an EPC and therefore fall within the MEES regime. And in addition to the existing penalties, including the maximum fine of £150,000, if a property has been let in breach of the PRS regulations, Landlords might also be fined up to £5,000 for breaches which include failing to register on the exemption register, failing to present a valid EPC by the required dates set out in the, in the compliance window regime, registering false or misleading information, and failing to provide a post-improvement EPC to demonstrate compliance. And that's the end of my session. I will bash you on. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope that you are all well. Um, Michaela and I are going to use the next few minutes to talk through some recent case law from the last year or so. We know that case law can be quite a dry subject, but we hope that you can hang in there with us and at least have a couple of takeaway points as food for thought going forwards. We've included four case references should you wish to delve deeper into the facts of each, but we'll try to summarise the key points as succinctly as possible. So I'm going to start with two cases that were born out of the COVID pandemic, but also have a wider reaching effect on renewal leases generally. The first case is Poundland case. Due to the pandemic, Lease parties, usually the tenant, have been seeking to amend lease terms. In particular, tenants are looking to amend rent suspension clauses so that they can uh, suspend the rent if there is any uh, other lockdown situations in the future. This is either specifically for COVID or for any other such emergency outbreak situation. In this case, the parties were negotiating the terms of a renewal lease. 
Whilst the parties had already agreed the annual rent, it was to be £130,000 per annum, it was going to be on a five-year term and no breaks at all. The tenant, Poundland, wanted a number of changes to the terms. One such amendment was a change to the rent suspension clause. Poundland proposed that the rent should be reduced by 50% during a period where there was a use prevention measure applied, i.e. another lockdown situation. Section 35 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 states that the court can determine lease terms in the lease renewal um, process. And when doing so, the court shall have regard to the terms of the current tenancy and to all relevant circumstances. The word in relevant circumstances uh, is significant here. The district judge was willing to take into account the effects of the pandemic when looking into those relevant circumstances. The district judge thought that the amendments to the rent suspension clause to reduce the rent uh, to 50% during any future lockdown was an unreasonable amendment to make. The justification, justification was that this amendment would impose a new risk upon the landlord which had previously been borne by the tenant. The Poundland case here can be compared to the next case as well, also from early 2021. If I could have the next slide, please. You'll see this is the uh, WH Smith retail holdings case. In a similar, similar fashion to the Poundland case, the parties were negotiating a lease renewal here. However, both parties accepted that the renewal lease could contain a pandemic rent suspension clause. That wasn't in question. The accepted position was that if there was a lockdown, then 50% of the rent would be suspended, but there would be a full service charge continuing to be paid throughout the pandemic period. Therefore, in this case, the court was only involved in deciding upon the correct trigger event for the agreed suspension. Essentially, the landlord argued that the trigger for the rent suspension clause should be on expiry of a four week period after the closure of non-essential retailers. WH Smith, however, argued that it should be immediately upon the closure of non-essential retailers. In this one, the court accepted the WH Smith position and the rent suspension clause should be triggered on the closure of all non-essential retailers. It's important to note that these are two county court cases and the judgments aren't binding. However, they do demonstrate the current thought process and decision-making process that the courts would be minded to follow. If I could have the next slide, please. I'll go on to a case which demonstrates the problems encountered when the terms of one lease are linked to the terms of another lease that is either going to be varied or surrendered. As you'll see, this case is the Rail for London Limited case against Hackney Council. It's a High Court case relating to an application to strike out a defence. RFL paid rent to Hackney for the railway arches and buildings at Kingsland Viaduct in London. The rent payable under the relevant lease is expressed as the rent payable pursuant to an underlease of the premises. In turn, the rent payable on the underlease was a profits-based rent, which was based on a percentage of net income derived from the business conducted by the undertenant at the property itself. The sticking point here was that the underlease had been surrendered in 2003, and it was also surrendered at a substantial premium too. RFL had continued to pay rent at the level assessed by way of reference to the surrendered underlease. RFL therefore asserted that no rent should be payable uh, since 2003, and they wanted Hackney to refund the full amount. Hackney obviously weren't too happy about this and their defence was multifaceted. But one interesting argument was that of an estoppel by convention had arisen based on the 16 year payment of rent 
throughout the period from 2003. Now, estoppel is a, a complex area of law, but basically this meant that both parties were dealing with the rental payment based on a shared common assumption that they were both acting correctly. And Hackney stated it would be unjust to now unpick that position. RFL argued that this defence should be struck out. The court decided that the application to strike out Hackney's defence should be rejected. The case should be heard, and now we're awaiting a full trial, so we need to watch this space. However, this case demonstrates the complexities of linking the terms of two leases together. It's always a risk when using such drafting. And it's always important to consider the life cycle of a lease and be very wary of cross-defining rent provisions. So what if the lease is varied or surrendered or part of the premises is not sublet and therefore doesn't generate a rent at all? These are all matters that need to be given serious thought. So these are my three cases. Uh, I'd like to now hand over to Michaela to continue with a few more uh, that she has been involved in. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, over the next few minutes, um, as Greg mentioned, I will be covering a further three cases, two of which concern the court's approach to dealing with restrictive covenants and a slightly older but high profile case concerning break clauses and vacant possession. Um, beginning with the latter, the case of Capital Park Leeds and Global Radio Services. This case was concerned with whether the tenant, Global, correctly exercised the break laws in their lease. Um, following a corporate acquisition back in 2014, Global became the tenant following an assignment of the lease. The term was for 24 years, expiring in November 2025, and there was a right to break the lease in February 2017, provided amongst other terms, the property was returned to the landlord with vacant possession. Having acquired various other properties during the acquisition, Global sought to offload surplus properties and they served a notice to, to end the lease. Um, in the lease itself, it's worth just highlighting that the definition of property was stated as including all fixtures and fittings at the premises were never fixed. So on this basis, um, and in view that the property was in a bad state of repair, Global stripped a range of items from the property. This included ceiling grids, floor finishes, pipe work, lighting, radio, radiators, the list goes on. Global then sought to agree the extent of the repairs with the landlord. Negotiations about the outstanding works failed and Global returned the keys to the landlord on the break date without reinstating any of the works. The landlord sought a judgment that the lease continued on the basis that the property was not returned with vacant possession. This case was escalated to the Court of Appeal. Um, and by way of summary only, the judge acknowledged that the fixtures and fittings removed were part of the original base build of the property and therefore part of the landlord's fixtures and fittings or elements of the building itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, in this case, uh, the judge concluded that the relevant break clause um, was actually concerned with ensuring that the property was free from, as with most leases, being returned free from people, chattels, or interests. And when interpreted objectively, the judge held that the manner in which Global terminated the lease was valid. On one hand, depending on the drafting in the lease, this case reassures tenants that they do not have to be concerned with leaving too little in the property to qualify for vacant possession. However, on the other hand, for landlords, um, it is also worth noting that the judge did recognize that the landlord had a right to pursue the tenant for damages by virtue of a breach of the repair and yielding up covenants in the lease. Next slide, please. Uh, turning now to some cases on restrictive covenants, uh, section 84 of the Law of Property Act 1925 provides the upper tribunal lands chamber with the power to discharge or modify restrictive covenants. In the interest of 
saving a bit of time, I have briefly noted on the slide circumstances in which the court may choose to exercise those powers. Generally, applications to the court will cite one or more of these circumstances to support their case. Next slide, please. So my case, first case being De Silvio and Sharp. Um, this case involved a dispute between a group of neighbours who live in a close in Wimbledon. The clause was subject to a building scheme, which specified that the landowner would not do, permit or suffer to be done anything on the property that would be an annoyance, nuisance or disturbance to owners or occupiers of any other property on the estate. Uh, so the Sharps wanted to build an extension to the house. Their neighbours objected. However, despite this, uh, the planning permission was granted. Knowing that their neighbours would continue to oppose the extension on the grounds that it breached the covenant, the Sharps applied to the court and they were granted a negative declaration that stated that the proposed extension would not breach the covenant. The neighbours then counterclaimed for a declaration that the extension was in breach of the covenant and also sought relief to prevent the extension. The judge rejected the counterclaim and held that the correct test to determine whether the extension would breach the covenant was actually set out in the 2008 High Court case of Denison Davis, which followed the 1888 authority of Todd Heatley. The hypothetical reasonable person test was applied, which required the court to decide on a binary basis whether a reasonable person living in the neighbors' houses would be annoyed by the proposed extension. The judge in the first instance and on appeal answered those questions and on all the evidence, this was answered in the negative and the extension was permitted. Next slide, please. Uh, my final case study is Cross and Coach House Muse. In this case, the applicants, the Crosses, were the freeholders of a property. They received planning consent for construction of a ground floor extension to the side rear of their property. The objecting neighbours, they were a group of freeholders um, and also a management companies which were owned by the freeholders on the estate. They all benefited from a covenant which prevented the erection of or material alteration or addition to the external appearance of any buildings, walls, fences or other structures. The crosses sought a modification from the court to permit the construction of the extension on the basis that they had already been granted planning consent. The court held, amongst other things, that the modification of the covenant to allow the extension would open floodgates of others seeking to extend their properties and this would also increase prospects of them being successful. The judge noted that the covenant in the prescribed form removed the element of uncertainty about what might be permitted in the future and provided assurance to own owners that the form of estate would not be disturbed so that effectively the value that you pay for your property is likely to be protected opposed to being reduced in value years on because of new works in the estate. It was clear that the covenant protected attributes that were worth preserving and the practical benefit conferred by the covenant was of substantial advantage. The requirements of section 84 of the Law of Property Act 1925 were therefore not satisfied, so the court did not grant the modification. So in these two cases that I have presented for you, um, you can see that there have been two very different outcomes, each turning on the facts and arguments presented in each case. Um, it is worth noting also that not because the person is granted planning consent necessarily means that a tribunal or court will follow suit. Um, Next slide, please. Um, I will then hand over to my colleague, Steve, who will discuss the Economic Crime Act. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the final part of the webinar now, so it won't keep you too much longer. But I'm going to be talking a bit about the Economic Crime Act. So um, if I can have my first slide up, thank you. Um, firstly, a bit of background. So. On the 15th of March this year, the UK passed the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act 2022, 
The Act contained measures designed to increase transparency in the ownership of UK property by overseas entities and also to give law enforcement enhanced powers to combat money laundering and sanctions breaches. Although it was recently rushed through Parliament in response to the events in Ukraine, it has been on the government's agenda for a number of years now. And the proposal to establish a regis register of overseas entities owning UK property was first announced by the then Prime Minister David Cameron in March 2016. And a draft economic crime bill was prepared in 2018. However, um, Progress on this had slowed as other areas of reform were being prioritised by the government. But in light of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, the government introduced a number of sanctions on Russia. And the introduction of the Economic Crime Act was part of that package of measures. So the Economic Crime Bill was introduced into Parliament on the 1st of March this year, and it received royal assent only two weeks later, so on the 15th of March this year. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? So what are the key areas of the Act? So the, there are three main areas of the Act. They are firstly, the introduction of a register of overseas entities. Secondly, reforms to unexplained wealth orders to strengthen their effectiveness. And thirdly, reforms to sanctions for breaches, including imposing strict liability for breaches. As part of this, we'll only be looking at the first part of that, so the register of overseas entities, though, um, as that's applicable to property matters. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? So what, what does the Act actually do? Part one of the Act establishes a public register of beneficial owners of non-UK of non entities that own or buy land in the UK. And this will be operated by Companies House. And any such overseas entity is going to be required to register with Companies House, take reasonable steps to identify its beneficial owners, and also provide verified information <coughs> excuse me, about each beneficial owner to Companies House. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? So who will qualify as an overseas entity. An overseas entity is going to be, is any non-UK corporate body, partnership or other entity that is a legal person under the law under which it's governed. So again, it's a, it's a fairly wide ranging definition. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? Um, what interests in land does the Act actually apply to? So they, the Act applies to um, overseas entities owning land in the UK, but what type of ownership is that? So the Act itself applies to, um, refers to qualifying estates, and they're defined as freehold estates in land or leasehold estates in land granted for a term of more, more than seven years. So in effect, you're talking compuls compulsorily registrable leases. So, but just a point to note, it needs to be more than seven years, not seven year terms. Um, could I have my next slide, please? And whereabouts does the Act apply? The, Act, the Act's measures are going to apply across the whole of the UK. Now, certain parts of the Act make provision for different jurisdictions to account for the differences in land law between England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. But the overriding policy objectives are similar across the whole of the UK. A point to note, though, that the comments in this webinar only apply to the law as it applies in England and Wales. Um, I haven't commented on the, the differences between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, can I have my next slide, please? So overseas entities and their beneficial owners are required to register, but who will qualify as a beneficial owner and therefore be required to submit their information? A registered a registrable, sorry, I should say, beneficial owner may be an individual legal entity, government or public authority that holds either directly or indirectly more than 25% of the shares and or voting rights in the overseas entity. 
holds, again, directly or indirectly, the right to appoint or remove a majority of the board of directors of the overseas entity, or has the right to exercise or actually does exercise significant influence or control over the overseas entity. So this is bringing it in line with the threshold for being a registrable beneficial owner under the existing people with significant control regime, which was introduced, uh, I think it was 2016, for, for UK companies and is now available um, at Companies House. So it, it brings the requirements for overseas entities in line with those for UK companies. A um, couple of further points to mention on that. A beneficial owner can also be a trust um, and where an overseas entity has no beneficial owner or where a beneficial owner is identified, but the entity is unable to provide required information in respect of that, that um, beneficial owner. The overseas entity is to provide a statement to Companies House to that effect, along with the information required relating to the entity itself. And once a beneficial owner is identified by an entity, that overseas entity must give notice to the beneficial owner. And then it's with the beneficial owner to state whether, the, whether or not they believe that they are beneficial owner. And they also must confirm correct or supply required information within one month from the date of notice that they receive from the, from the entity. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So as far as the information that's required, what, what do they actually have to provide? On the next three slides, I've set out the information. I won't go into any great detail about it, but generally the overseas entity itself will need to provide its name, country of incorporation, registered or principal office, service and email address, and the legal form of, it, of the entity and any public register it's on and registration number. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Any beneficial owner, which is a corporate entity, will have to provide more or less the same information, but they also need to provide details of the date on which they became the ben a beneficial owner of the overseas entity, and also why the beneficial owner meets the beneficial owner conditions, so the conditions we've run, over pre run through previously. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And then as far as a beneficial owner, being an individual is concerned, they're required to provide their name, date of birth, nationality, um, residential address, service address, date on which they became a beneficial owner, and again, why they meet, uh, why they meet the uh, beneficial owner condition, and also whether they're a designated person uh, under the um, sanctions and anti-money laundering act. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, couple of points to note, the register needs to be updated by the overseas entity annually. Therefore, any overseas entity is going to have to be constantly monitoring the information that they hold. And any changes to that information must be submitted to Companies House on a yearly basis. And they're going to, overseas entities are going to have to make sure that they, they keep that information accurate so it can be supplied yearly. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the obligation on the overseas entity to register is not only going to apply to property which it acquires from this date forward. It also has retrospective effect. So it applies to land acquired on or after the 1st of January 1999 in England and Wales. Now the date is different for, for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but as far as, you, uh, as far as England and Wales property is concerned, it will apply to land acquired on or after the 1st of January 1999. So overseas entities already owning UK real estate or acquiring property before part one of the Act comes into force have a six month transitional period with which to apply for registration as an overseas entity at Companies House. That six month period is going to commence once the register has been launched. From the 28th of February 2022 until the end of the six month transitional period, the registration requirements apply irrespective of whether the overseas entity wishes to sell the property during that time. 
So all overseas entities will therefore be caught by the requirement to register unless they dispose of their property before the 28th of February 2022. Once the register is in force, overseas entities will not be able to be registered as holding title to UK property without being entered onto the register unless they're exempt. Now there are certain exemptions, the Secretary of State can exempt someone, but they're fairly limited. So they're in the interest of national security, economic well-being in the UK, or for the purposes of preventing or detecting serious crime. So I think the majority of, uh, for the majority of overseas entities, the exemptions are not going to apply. So the, the assumption should be that they will need to be registered. Um, could I have my next slide, please? The Land Registry will be placing restrictions onto title registers for overseas entities to inform third parties checking title registers that the property cannot be sold unless the seller has registered as an overseas entity at company's house. There is, however, provision in the Act that this restriction will not apply to a disposition made pursuant to a contract that was entered into um, before the restriction was entered into the register. So if you've already contracted with an overseas entity for the acquisition of property, then the restriction should not apply. So you won't be bound by that, by the fact that you entered into the contract before you were even aware of the act. There are also exemptions from the restriction where the disposition is made in specified circumstances by an insolvency practitioner, but we don't have details yet of what those specified circumstances are. I recently checked the title register for an overseas client of ours and um, the restriction hadn't yet been put on the register. So we don't exactly know when they're going to go on, but the Act states that they should be on before the end of the six month transitional period. So we can expect that the restrictions will be placed onto registers of overseas entities at any time now. Um, can I have my next slide, please? So what happens if overseas entities fail to comply? Um, Failure to register as an overseas entity at company's house or submitting false information is a criminal offence. And it will also prevent the entity from being able to buy or sell UK property in the future. A transfer of land by the overseas entity in breach of the registration requirements is also a criminal offence. And it's committed not only by the entity, but every responsible officer of that entity. And it's punishable by a fine of up to five years in by sorry, either a fine or up to five years imprisonment. It should also be noted that there are offences of failure um, by a registrable beneficial owner to comply with the duty to provide information. So where a beneficial owner is notified by the entity itself, if they fail to comply with that duty to provide information, that's a criminal offence. And also it will be an offence to, um, to fail to comply with the duty to update the, um, the information at company's house on a yearly basis. In each case, giving rise to liability on conviction to imprisonment or a fine or both. So um, we'll have to see whether, how, how diligently there and that's actually enforced, but, but that's the potential liability. Um, could I have my next slide, please? Couple of further points to note, um, once the overseas entity has been entered onto the register, it will be allocated an overseas entity ID number. So that will then be required for any further transaction in relation to UK property. Um, also, the public will be able to inspect certain information on the register, including the identity of the overseas entity and its beneficial owners. But this will exclude information which would contravene sorry, UK data protection legislation. Um, can I have my next slide, please? So what's the current status? Although it's actually received royal assent, not all of the act is actually currently in force. Presently only the reforms to the unexplained wealth orders and the majority of the sanctions reforms are in force. The parts of the act relating to the register of overseas ent entities are currently only prospective law and they will be brought into force in due course by regulations. 
I think it was um, 23rd of June, so a couple of weeks ago, the draft register of overseas entities um, regulations 2022 were published and they provide for the implementation of certain aspects of the new register of overseas entities. The secondary legislation confirms that the register um, will be a digital service and it will launch on gov.uk this summer. So work on the register is progressing quickly and we understand that there are going to be two further sets of secondary legislation published soon, plus a commencement order, which will then confirm the start date of the new register. And then once the register is live, the six month um, transition period for over, overseas entities to register will commence. So we're expecting that six month period to commence fairly quickly. And once the register is live, the overseas entity will then need to register with Companies House before applying to register their land purchase at the land register. Um, can I have my final slide, please? So what, what do you need to do, both if you're an overseas entity or, or indeed a UK, uh, UK entity? If you're an overseas entity and you do hold property in the UK, which you acquired since the 1st of January 1999, or you plan to acquire property in the UK, then you should be putting in place that now the necessary steps um, to identify all registrable beneficial owners and compile the necessary documentation, both in respect of the overseas entity itself and all of its reg registrable, but registrable beneficial owners, because that information is going to be required shortly to be submitted to Companies House. It's also going to be worth putting in place internal processes to make sure that it is easy to comply with the yearly updating duty. Again, given the fact that the, uh, the um, offence for failure to comply not only is an offence of the entity, it's an offence of the officers of the entity. Overseas entities are going to want to make sure that they comply with their, um, their duty to update each year. If you're a UK company, then it's probably worthwhile right now identifying any ongoing or potential transactions you have, so both sales and leases with overseas entities. And if you're negotiating any contracts or agreements, then making sure that those contracts or agreements include the necessary provisions requiring the overseas entity to register at Companies House once the register goes live. And going forwards, it's probably going to be best practice when negotiating leases or sales with an overseas entity to, ob to obtain from the overseas entity at the earliest possible opportunity. So hopefully when heads of terms are being negotiated, their ID number um, to make sure that they are registered at company's um, house and ensure that um, any potential issue with the fact that they are not registered is flagged at the earliest possible opportunity. I think there's a question about would you propose that new lease clauses are required to cover this legislation? Um, I think the answer is probably yes at the moment. The problem being that if you contract with someone before a restriction has entered into, it won't apply. However, we don't know when those restrictions are going to go on title and generally a solicitor will do a priority search so you'll be made aware of potentially any changes to the register before you complete. But I think given we know that there is the pending uh, pending changes that are going to be coming in, I would certainly, if I was contracting with an overseas entity, include an obligation on them um, to ensure that they provide the required information and use all reasonable endeavours to register at Companies House and provide ultimately their ID number, which is what you, you are going to need to then be able to register your lease, your sale, con uh, sorry, your transfer, um, whatever it may be. I don't know if that answered that. I think there was a question as well in relation to the MEES regulations. What happens in April 2023 if a property does not currently have a registered EPC? Does a landlord need to obtain a new EPC at that point in order to meet MEES or can they wait until a later trigger point, i.e. the expiry and reletting? Um, this one will probably depend on the basis for the occupation. So the absence of a valid EPC could be helpful 
to a landlord of potentially substandard property, which is currently let and where it's going to continue to be let after April 2023. If the landlord wants to delay improving the property so that it's no longer substandard and they can't claim a legitimate reason not to do so under the MEES regulations, they're going to want to postpone for as long as possible the point when an EPC is commissioned. Um, I would say it's important to check both the EPC and the MEES regimes um, because there are some inconsistencies between the both and it will depend on how the property is occupied. So we're under a Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 protected tenancy, either the fixed term has expired, the start of the continuation tenancy could amount to letting the property as a result to the renewal of an existing tenancy within the second limb of Regulation 27.2. Um, so it's important that that would trigger it at that point. Um, and as well as that, it's important to note that properties that don't need an EPC are not within the MEES regime. So the MEES regulations do not also apply to short lettings less than six months or over 99 years. So they wouldn't be applicable if that was the scenario. I think there's a further question from Robert as well. Sorry, did you finish there, Rebecca? We'll finish. Yes, I'm oh, done. Sorry, didn't want to cut across you. Um, so there's a further question from Robert about um, whether it applies to overseas, uh, overseas owners in Jersey, Bahamas, other tax havens, the answer is yes. It applies to any non-UK entity. So although the, the Act, the, um, the Economic Crime Act was brought in as a result of the um, sanctions um, to strengthen the sanctions against Russia, it is in no way limited to Russia or anything to do with Russia. It applies to any non-UK entity including Jersey and Bahamas. Um, and then I've just come in on another question. What would you advise a landlord to do to comply with the MEES regulations if they have an existing lease for a building that's below the minimum standard in September, 2023? And um, so I think on this point, it's probably key to negotiate improvement works in advance with the tenants have a look at the lease, check if the leases provide that the costs can be passed on to tenants um, or consider whether any exemptions apply. Um, let me just have a look, sorry. Are there any MEES exemptions for properties that are let but not occupied as not in a suitable state or repair with an office of the heating does not work? Um, that's something I think I'll have to have to look into. I imagine that's not being tested, but um, I can drop you an email back on that if you wouldn't mind putting me a line. 